part of the team that was to look at the Greenland shrimp fishery uh, and see what we might find out about whether ocean acidification was a problem for this fishery or not and how it might be addressed. So the, the scientists came to the economists and they presented us with this plan, right? That the scientists would tell us what they knew about the modeling for uh, ocean acidification and then we would tell them what we knew about fisheries and somehow that would give us an answer. A lot of relatively decent science has, has been done that way over time, but we can do much better because the reality is we can't tell you what those socioeconomic effects are going to be if we don't know sort of what happens to the shrimp under different conditions, what management, what policy might be applied. So these things are iterative on the socioeconomic side. But they're also iterative on the science side. If it turns out that monitoring in the middle, those yellow dots are where the monitoring has been taking place, if that's not the place to monitor, to get information that helps us, maybe we need to move those, those monitoring stations in ways that can give us better information. Maybe we can know where to put those because of the questions that arise in the economic side of things. Uh, and this is, of course, true in understanding the stock assessment and catch data as well. So, we have a team of biogeochemists, economists, uh, Greenland fisheries managers looking at this whole story to see sort of what we could say about what might happen. And we have some descriptive questions sort of what might happen to the shrimp fishery as a consequence of ocean acidification. And there's a scientist who wanted to find out if it was going to matter to people. So he taste tested shrimp that had been reared in more acidic uh, conditions. And you can see that his taste test suggests that people don't like change. Right? That the best tasting one was the one in sort of current ocean conditions, and the more acidic, uh, in general, the less attractive that shrimp was. Of course, taste might change over time as well. These are sort of the short run versus the long run uh, market impacts. You might discover you have a great taste for it if they become super cheap, for example. Uh, also descriptive is what might happen to the fishery. So uh, Greenland, as we'll talk about a little bit more, gets almost all of its cash in its economy from fishing. So that's a pretty important sector. They keep pretty good data. And so we have an idea of sort of how much is harvested, what it's worth, what has been spent on it in terms of management, and we have a, a rent per shrimp of you know, somewhere between 1.77, 1.9 kroner per kilo. So those are the rents, the, the profit above uh, what it's costing to catch those shrimp. And that forms uh, quite a substantial piece of the Greenland cash economy. Uh, so we want to know if that's at risk and what, what to do about it. Um, so we can think about these descriptive questions falling into categories of what will happen to the biological production, what will happen to supply, what will happen to demand. Okay. And we can think then about the normative questions, what do we do about it? Well, it depends. What are these fishery goals? Is it to uh, get rich and move into cell phone production? Is it to continue to harvest shrimp for uh, generation after generation? What, what sort of uh, goals are there in the industry? 
and amongst the participants. And what are the options? Can we prevent this from happening? Probably not individually as Greenland. Okay. Can we develop some sorts of resilience, either ecological resilience or perhaps economic resilience? So ecological resilience might be something like, can we aquaculture these shrimps somehow? Can we increase the um, base, the juvenile populations? Economic resilience might be something like increasing the species diversity um, or the places in which we harvest these. Or should we just sort of accommodate the change and or try and make reparations for what's lost and, and move on? So how can we maybe do that as scientists with a research plan? Well, is there a change in ocean pH? Well, we can find that out and see what will happen. What will that change do to the shrimp? We can try and find that out. Can we then use that to see how a bioeconomic model uh, would say you should think about changing your harvest behavior? What would the consequences of that on the shrimp fishery and its constituents be? And then what scope does it give you for managing and fishing? To put that all into a single model space, we can think about the blue area as an amorphous biogeochemical ecosystem and economic space, where you have biology and economics overlapping. The biology of the shrimp, these are Pendalis borealis, the northern shrimp, um, might change, but so might the economic part of the story. The things that might change it might be the external forces, including OA, but also temperature and other climate changes. The economic changes are, are direct human drivers for, for the fishery, including both demand and cost shifts, infrastructure investments, and any sort of regulatory and management framework changes. Uh, how resilient the system is, is part of the adaptation of both the ecosystems and the social systems. So again, the question of infrastructure investments may come up, and also the use of substitutes and complements in either production or consumption. Do we just all eat southern shrimp? Uh, do we change the, fish, uh, vessel, the fishing vessels to other species? How do we uh, adapt? All of these create the flow of ecosystem services that are generating these rents uh, that allow us to think about the shrimp fishery within a bigger context of any economically and ecologically related factors, which might be cod, or how the, the shrimp taste, or how uh, labor is evolving in the industry. So, what might happen to the oceans? We have, I guess, Nadia Steiner, who some of you may know, uh, has done a lot of work on the Canadian waters and Baffin Bay as well to see what predictions might be possible for different qualities. And we can see that the, the light blue is Hudson Bay and the green is Baffin Bay. So the green is what we're sort of looking at here. Temperature, probably going up. Primary production looks relatively flat. pH, definitely going down. So what of these can we maybe work from to think about what will happen to shrimp populations and shrimp productivity. I'm going to focus on primary production. And to do that, we can think a little more about what's happening with pH and aragonite, which is what allows us to continue to calcify. And you can see, as we move from now to the future, that these are expected 
to drop. But when we look more closely at primary production in Baffin Bay, so let's see if I can make that. Uh, sometimes it's hard to look at the Arctic if you're not used to it. This is Greenland, so we're talking about this area here. Okay. There's fairly, fairly uh, significant agreement that nitrate, surface nitrates will go down. And there's some less agreement throughout the Arctic as to whether primary production will go up or down. Baffin Bay Davis Strait looks like it should go down, but that's the estimate, that it's going to go down by 0.18 with an air bound twice that size. Right? So zero is in that air bound, so it could be not changing, it could be getting uh, more primary production. So we don't know if there's more food for the shrimp to eat, less food for the shrimp to eat, or really no change. So already we're, we're starting to be at a loss as to, to know what to think about what might happen to the, to the shrimp population. So that would be a good place for more science. Um, and then what will happen as a biological response? What would we like to know? We'd like to know if there will be population changes and or spatial shifts in those populations and which of these multiple stressors they might be coming from and how those stressors might interact. So again, so here's the southern portion of Greenland. Here's Atlantic seaboard of Canada. This is the shrimp fishery we're talking about. Most of the shrimp are right now over in the Greenland side of things. These are the Canadian uh, Atlantic shrimp, which may become important later. So is this going to be a bottom-up problem? Is there going to be nothing to eat or more to eat? Well, we've just said we don't know. Is it a top-down problem? Are there going to be more cod to eat the shrimp? Maybe. There are historical periods where the cod have shown up and consumed a lot of shrimp. Those are things that the fisheries managers have been thinking about and do include in their models, but they don't have it quite right yet. Uh, and we'll see that in a, in a little bit. <coughs> um, and also this direct effect. Are they going to be bigger? Are they going to taste better? Are they going to be smaller? Which is the more likely outcome? And taste worse, supposedly. Um, and how is that going to affect the population and the distribution? We can see, so this is the percent of the shrimp that are caught north of 66 degrees. We can see that that's been increasing. So this is perhaps biological, but it's perhaps economic as well as boats are able to move further north for longer periods of time, right? you may just catch more up there that haven't really been caught before. Uh, and this is the spread index, sort of how wide a range. Also scientifically, the change could come at any point. We have a life cycle. We don't know exactly how ocean acidification is going to affect the shrimp in any meaningful way. You would think maybe somebody had studied this relatively important economic uh, species, but no, we know very little, right? Um, we know from other species where we might start studying things, right? That there could be juvenile effects, there could be problems in the transformation the timing uh, from male to female. And so the biologists did some research and found, nope, nobody's looked. We have no idea. Right? The closest we've got is another species of shrimp where maybe, maybe the females grow slower. Maybe. Probably not. It's maybe. Right? 
So, again, more ambiguous effects. All right? That's never stopped an economist before. So what should we do if we want to build a bioeconomic model? We can think about, well, we need to know when are the shrimp transitioning from male to female? So we can have a transitions matrix for that. That we could plug into a cohort model to tell us sort of the age at which we're going to have the main transition to the females who are going to be sort of the size we want for tasty eating. We'd also like to know sort of what the cod are going to eat. And so this is the model telling us how the effect of cod stock and the shrimp population are related to what we're going to lose to the cod, which should give us you know, a nice path for fishing mortality and harvest that could tell us how much to catch. That sounds great. Okay. Well, we just said, we don't know this, we don't know this. We kind of know this, but we think we're wrong, which means this is pretty, but not very meaningful. Okay. And then if we try to throw prices and rents on, we've already seen these. We've got them to use if we get that far, uh, but they might be changing as well if there are more substitutes uh, if gas prices change the costs of fishing, if the shrimp move further offshore, etc., etc. So, what, what's at stake? Is it worth spending some science to know these things? Well, probably, right? 90%, actually more than, it's more like 95% of Greenland's exports are from fish products. That's about 50% of Greenland's market economy, 20% of their gross national income from fisheries, and shrimp are more than half of those fisheries. So it's a big piece of the puzzle. Uh, for the employment side of things, you have the ability to process these shrimp in lots of different locations. So you have, remember Greenland is about 50,000 people, most of whom are Inuit, right? So you have a chance for jobs. Royal Greenland has at least 10 processing plants in Greenland, two of which have been uh, processing shrimp for almost a century. And then you have some newer companies uh, that are also involved. It's not necessarily a direct impact on Inuit, it's not like marine mammals. Uh, the shrimp were not a mainstay of indigenous diet. So this is sort of nice from a research perspective that this is a little bit separate and involves uh, the market economy. Um, but if you're becoming more and more reliant on those markets and or you are consuming more of them, it can can be indirectly uh, a food security or health issue. But all of these are going to be endogenous to what you decide about management and policy at local and international levels. So you have questions of Arctic governance. Uh, you may know that there is a, an Arctic Council of the eight Arctic states. How is Greenland represented in those? Denmark, exactly, right? So they don't even have the seat directly at the table. Denmark does uh, the foreign policy for Greenland. So uh, Denmark is acting on Greenland's behalf. And the Arctic Council is very focused on collaboration and cooperation. And they don't talk about fisheries at all because it's too contentious. Okay? 
So your main Arctic governance mechanism isn't uh, able to think about the shrimp altogether, but you do have the um, North Atlantic Fisheries Organization, NAFO, and ICES, uh, which both, both contribute to research. Um, and it, this shrimp fishery is, in fact, MSC certified for whatever that's worth. Um, and you can see that in getting that certification, they brought down from harvest a bit over, over the last uh, decades. But you can see that the fishery has had a peak and is reducing its, its catch over time. And that if we're trying to think about what to do about changes that are going to move the shrimp or make them uh, smaller, less frequent, Greenland's already experienced some of these changes in other dimensions. So the, the impacts are already spatially differentiated. We already can see that uh, catch and effort and catch per unit of effort have begun to vary uh, in the different NAFO divisions in ways that are moving vessels around, moving um, effort around. So we, we've seen, we see some response at sea, and we see some response at shore. These are those processing plants. Uh, the, these numbers here are just how many plants are at the location. Nuke obviously is the biggest location with the most plants, but Sisimia is the one that's sort of growing. And you can see lots of places that had a boom that's gone away. Right. So you've got these processing facilities at all these towns in Greenland right, uh, that have already been faced with a boom and bust situation to try and figure out um, what to do next, it's not new. It's not a threat that hasn't already had some kinds of um, responses. And so there is there's something to work with in terms of people knowing what's at stake and wanting to build some stability. But Going back to our original plan to tell people how to get that, we were able to say, yes, there's some change in ocean pH that we think is coming. What's going to happen to the shrimp? Nobody knows yet. What a biological and economic model should look like? Yeah, we, we probably have picked out some of the key features that would, that would matter a lot, but telling us what they will do to the shrimp fishery, we can't do that because we don't really know how those are going to shift. So what, what is being done currently, and can we do better, given that we don't really know uh, what's coming? So the direct management in the present is that there is an annual assessment model that does include cod predation. It's a Bayesian surplus production model uh, that basically says how many shrimp there are to catch. With their yearly surveys, they can set quotas. The quotas are divided by an inshore fleet and an offshore fleet. Uh, there are requirements for not just catch quota, but processing quota, so that work stays in Greenland. Um, it's updated every year, and there's a new recommendation every year. And then, uh, as I said, there's these onshore processing requirements sort of indirectly support uh, the Greenland fishing communities. So that's, that's actually basically pretty state of the art for fisheries management. You've got two species, that's, you know, of the hundreds of, of um, fisheries being monitored and regulated, there are only, you know, something like 20 or 25 that actually have multiple species in their, in their models. Uh, and it's annual and it's pretty, pretty well observed. So, 
maybe there's nothing to do right now in that, but can we think about where to monitor and what we could gain from that monitoring? Well, there's some idea that ocean acidification is going to increase sort of coming from the north and push south, and that the effects of it will be stronger on these Canadian fisheries than they will here first um, because of the biogeochemical composition of this shelf versus this. Uh, and that temperature increases are going to come more from the south. So if, if we're collecting monitoring data a little more specifically in terms of the ways in which those directions are evolving, we might be able to tease out ocean acidification from some of these other uh, concerns. What else should we be studying? So here's your checklist of all the things IOF can do over the next, I don't know, n years. Geochemical changes. Well, just what will be happening with CO2 and what will that do to ocean temperatures? Here's the Greenland case. Right? These are uh, bottom temperatures, and you can see they've already jumped up since the late 90s. So we already have some idea of what these temperatures might look like, but they may change again. Uh, what are the biological and biogeochemical responses? How is the survival rate going to change? Are individuals and populations going to have a harder time? Right? Are they going to grow more slowly? Are they going to become female later? Are they going to have fewer or more uh, reproductive strategies? Then what's happening at the ecological or community levels? What, what's happening with those cod? Are they going to show up uh, and eat any of the shrimp that do exist? Is there going to be more primary production for the shrimp or less? And what about the habitat overall? So as I said, the cod model, they're not really sure that they've got the story straight. Here is from the 90s till now. The effective cod biomass jumped up in the uh, late 90s, sorry, this is, sorry, late 80s. Uh, and then it's been relatively flat. And now it's, it's on the rise again. The cod are coming back. Greenland would kind of prefer the cod. They're worth more than the shrimp, right? So they wouldn't necessarily mind feeding all the shrimp to the cod. So the economic consequences of this uh, could be important to consider. Again, there's the spread and northerly index. So they're, the, they're moving around. But are they moving around because of economic or ecological reasons? That should be uh, figured out. Are those tastes in are those changes in taste real? Do they scale up? Do they scale over time? Do we all get sort of used to them? Um, how do they fare in relation to other shrimp? And that's just taste testing uh, the one species. These are the slow-going northern species that aren't as big on the market as uh, southern prawns, for example. And then what's happening with all these feedbacks plus any technological developments, which could be things that enhance the stocks or catch them faster or catch them more cleanly. It's hard to know, but it is evident that prices have been going up. Right? Price index has gone, has doubled sort of in the last five, ten years. So it's, they are worth something and becoming worth more. Okay? Sum up then? Well, we're being able to say anything about the change in shrimp caused by ocean acidification. At, or other climate change is, is still very dubious. We've tried moving from end-to-end -end modeling, from the biogeochemistry to the management. 
Uh, we need to be conscious about it, but that doesn't mean we should ignore it. By figuring out where those gaps are, we know where to put the science, we know where to think about sort of uh, investment decisions outside of just the management of the species in terms of whether we should harvest fewer or more in any given year. We probably don't have any chance to get ahead of this issue. There's, there's not a lot of prevention that we can do. We've missed that point. Uh, but we can monitor and be adopted to the results of that monitoring, particularly if we cooperate more with Canada to know more about what's happening uh, to their fisheries, especially if the change is going to happen there first. We can think about building economic resilience, right? try and maintain and enhance flexible onshore capital investments. So maybe multi-species processing, don't invest in a bunch of uh, shrimp processors if the cod are going to come back. They are doing some of that. And also, to get the most uh, return on your scientific investment, probably worth thinking about understanding the market impacts, whether they're taste or substitutability, but also some things that can be done in the lab about the genetic adaptability of the species and how the population as a whole might be able to um, react to changes in ocean acidification. So what's next? Make it bigger. Taking all that uncertainty and embracing it. Right? And thinking about these questions as giving us the bioeconomic foundations for meeting uh, sustainable development goals. So, in particular, we have goal 14, life below water. And if we want to think about sort of the nutshell question, how should we develop bioeconomic models that more broadly incorporate industrial or sectoral shifts and risks so that we can have improved internal solutions, for example, harvesting more or fewer or in different spatial locations, uh, that are uh, reinforced and supported by improved external solutions, uh, including community and individual investments. If it's time for Greenland to get out of shrimp and into cell phones, then let's do that rather than uh, drive the shrimp into um, extinction and not get to cell phones. So, as I said at the beginning, this is part of my sabbatical funded by the um, Danish Research Council, and a lot of this Arctic work has been supported by uh, other locations as well.